What's up guys, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This is episode 89 to be precise, uh, which is the first episode of 2022 and indeed the first episode of season three. So today's episode, I am gonna be talking about predictions for 2022. And when I say predictions, I'm not talking about my own predictions necessarily. I'm talking about the predictions that I'm seeing from the very big names, the big economic sort of power um, players in the world. Um, people like Elon Musk and Ray Dalio and stuff like that. So I'm also going to give you my own views on what they, uh, what they have said, whether I agree or disagree, and what kind of strategy, or perhaps a better word would be, what kind of posture should a property investor have going into 2022. So without further ado, let us jump into the show. You are listening to Behind the Facade, the number one podcast for investing with a particular focus on real estate and property investment. I am your host, Gavin J. Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and your behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, in today's talk, I'm going to be covering some of the economic predictions that the really big names like Elon Musk and Ray Dalio and um, one name in particular that I've been listening to quite a bit is Peter Schiff. And these guys are all kind of quite big names in the world of finance. Certainly Elon Musk's name is the richest man in the world. Uh, he seems to capture a lot of attention and everyone seems to be following his every word and uh, things like Tesla and SpaceX, they've all done incredibly well. So the guy, naturally, when he has an opinion, everyone wants to kind of uh, take some take note of it. Now, the, uh, the, the, the issue, the reason why I'm covering these is because these are people that can really move markets. Like the, what they make suggestions, suddenly the whole market takes note and the whole thing can actually really start to move in that direction significantly. So what have they been saying? The, the general view from all of them is that there is an imminent market crash or an economic crash right around the corner. And in the case of Elon, Elon Musk said that uh, he was on Twitter recently and he was asked by somebody if he had any predictions on when there would be a, the, uh, you know, the next crash. And he said, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, but he said more or less that it's very hard to predict macroeconomics. But if it was his good instinct, he would say that um, the first or second quarter of this year, 2022. So the next six months, basically, he's predicting that there could be a major market crash. And um, when you hear things like that, you kind of sit up and, and take note because you start to kind of wonder, does he know something that we don't? Obviously, he's selling cars and he's doing all that kind of stuff. But what is driving these uh, scary predictions that he has made and that people like Ray Dalio are making? And what it all boils down to is inflation. And uh, longtime listeners of the podcast will know that back in June or late June of uh, 2021, I went and did a kind of a deep dive into inflation. And I covered you know, the history of inflation and the effect that it can have on, on the market. And... Um, since then, uh, that was episode 61, by the way, if you want to go back and listen to that, um, I put in some views of how it could impact the market and, you know, the kind of risks that were out there for everybody. Um, and it was mostly around borrowing rates going up. And that was one of the things that I really kind of thought was particularly risky for people. And if you're going out buying a property and you're thinking that the interest rates are kind of like pretty low at the moment and you can kind of borrow quite a lot of money um, because your pay, you know, your repayments are quite low all of a sudden you could be looking at a big rates increase because the central bank has to fight inflation and you'd be thinking to yourself whoa what would happen if my rate was to double and suddenly i'm paying you know this much much more than i ever expected to have to pay and i've been in that situation in the past and you go from this situation where if you're on a floating sort of variable rate you go from the situation where you're having you have a nice sort of a healthy profit every month um, you're paying so much in interest and there's a bit left over and that healthy profit just goes straight into the pocket there was no issue 
but um, suddenly that starts to get eroded away. And I can remember watching um, the you know, ECB, in, in this case, because I'm based in Ireland, the ECB was the one to watch. And when they, when the European Central Bank made a move on the interest rates, suddenly you would see the banks within a couple of days had adjusted the rate and suddenly you were paying that little bit more. And I can remember it getting tighter and tighter and tighter to the point where the next rate increase that happened was actually going to force me to have to put money into the the, uh, the the loan repayment as opposed to having that uh, profit up until that point. Anyway, um, you know, if I go back in time and, um, you know, I can talk about the 1970s and how inflation was a major issue. I cover all of that in episode 61. And rather than discuss it now, you know, you should probably just go back and listen to that. But one of the things that I wanted to say is that at the time, I've changed my view slightly. Because at the time, um, in the 1970s, the last time there was a kind of a major issue with inflation, interest rates uh, were about 14%. And so the, the central bank had some leeway or it had like mechanism to kind of adjust things. And to go from 14% to say 18%, which I believe the US Fed uh, did that. And that is a, represents a 28% increase. And um, nowadays when we are at... 0.1 in the US and we're at negative interest in the EU and then the UK I think it's at 0.25 or whatever it is I mean <clears throat> the rates are so so low that any kind of a, a tiny increase like if you were to double the rate uh, from 0.25 to 0.5 it's not going to have any impact on rates you're going to have to like substantially increase rates in order to have the kind of inflationary impact that you want to have and so you'd be talking about instead of a 28 percent increase you could be talking about like a 500 percent increase or something like that and if you're looking at that then it's a significant increase in your payments and so i was very worried about that and i thought that could be something that would actually catch any borrowers who have recently bought a property because they would have they would have, you know, there's so much rent coming in, so much expectation of what your rent can be and how much you can increase it by. Certainly here in Ireland, you've got the rent control zones and, and, and that exists around different parts of the world as well. <clears throat> and if you're in a situation where your, you know, your borrowings are matched more or less, your payment of interest on the borrowings is matched more or less equally with your rent uh, that you're collecting, or maybe you've got a little bit of a profit rent or whatever it is. But... When you start to see that get eroded, it gets a little bit nerve wracking and nobody wants to get into the property business to have to actually take money out of, say, their salary or some other area where they're making money and start putting it in. So in this particular case, um, what, what's changed in my view is that I didn't, I failed to recognize before that the biggest borrowers at the moment are not us individual investors out there, but the actual governments themselves. And you're talking about um, post-COVID, all of the governments around the world have had to actually borrow billions, if not trillions of, of dollars, euro, yen, in pounds, whatever it is. And these trillions all have to be repaid at some point. And if they increase their interest rates by 500%, the biggest impact is going to be on their own repayments themselves because they have gone and they have borrowed um, I mean, in the in the case of the Irish government, I remember looking at the budget a year ago, and I think it was forty billion, and the previous budget prior to that was like eight billion or something like that. So you're talking about a five x growth in the size of the borrowings in one year, and um, and all of that has to somehow get repaid over time. And if you're going to go from charging you know one percent or even half a percent or a quarter of a percent. Um, on that and then suddenly increase it to two or three percent the cost of the borrowings that the government is going to have to actually make themselves is going to go massively up and they're going to suddenly be in a situation where they've got to double taxes and things like that and create all sorts of ways to kind of repay to make the payments just on the interest alone not the actual capital repayment which is already huge so that being the case you know debt the piles of debt that these governments have all amassed is absolutely massive now. And I believe that more, I, I can remember hearing that more money has been printed in America in the last two years, uh, eight times more money in the last two years than the previous hundred years or something like that. So it's, um, 
it's really significant the amount of money that the governments have borrowed. And so for that reason, there's actually probably a cap on the amount that they can increase rates. And that being the case that we are probably going to be looking at inflation as something that we actually have to get used to and get um, and get kind of comfortable with. And if you're going to get into a situation where the um, where the where interest um, on payments and stuff like that is going to be it's going to be a little bit higher, but it is going to be maintained kind of low for a while. How is the government going to repay this huge debts that they've accumulated? And I think what is probably more likely now is that they are going to actually intentionally allow inflation to actually start to grow so that it can erode the size of the debts that they have you know taken out in the last um, two years over COVID and if they don't um, do that like how are you going to repay it like what you're basically doing is asking future generations to repay these you know billions and trillions of of pounds euro yen whatever it is Um, now in the case of Ray Dalio and Ray has this great book called Principles, which um, I recommend that you guys go out and buy and read. But the um, the inflation situation for him, he he says that it's really quite serious. And he's looked back at history and um, and various empires over the years, and he's predicting that you know this could actually create a major problem for America because over the years, there's pa- similar patterns have been followed. And you get into a situation where there can actually be civil unrest because the problem with inflation is that if you're a wealthy investor, it's not really a problem for you because your assets are going to go up in price. And so you're just going to become wealthier and wealthier and your debt is going to get smaller and smaller. Whereas if you are a small time investor or not a small time investor, say you're a working class person, say you're a person who doesn't have any investments and who has just a salary and it's a low you know base pay or whatever it is um if you're in a situation like that you can actually get into a situation where fuel costs are become prohibitive F- you know food costs have just shot up in the last 12 months or so they become prohibitive you suddenly find that everybody's much worse off and you start to get the civil unrest where people are out protesting demanding increases in pay and the, there's this wider widening of the the social kind of uh, classes, and you get you know the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the the bigger that that grows, the more risk of social unrest. And he, I think, he might have been tongue in cheek when he said it, but thinking about potential for civil war and things like that. So all interesting. Uh, Peter Schiff is another interesting guy that you should possibly go and um, listen to. He's actually got a podcast himself called um, the Schiff, Peter Schiff Show. And I've just been listening to it recently and he outlines all of the issues with inflation and, and things like this. But he's of the view that everybody should be getting out of cash and getting into gold and things like that. And he's predicting that gold will shoot up in the next few years. And he's very much against crypto. He's very much of the view that crypto is is just this kind of bubble at the moment that that is going to collapse. So where do I where do I fit in in all this? And um, I do think inflation will drive up asset prices. So I think being an investor is probably a good thing. And if you've got investments in property or whatever, you're going to probably do quite well over the next couple of years, provided that the repayments that you're making don't go out of your reach. You know, if you get into that point where it becomes more expensive than you can afford that's a really difficult situation to be in but I can remember my first property like everybody at the time when you buy something it seems expensive and then 10 years later or 20 years later you look back and you can't believe how cheap you bought it and that is the way it always is people today I get messages from people saying you know prices are you know as high as they were back in 2008 so the market is about to to, you know to come to an end is the view but I can remember when I bought my first property, I think I paid 75000 for it. And I sold it, you know, 20 years later for 750000 So 10 times it grew in that period of time. My second home or the, the second property I bought was my, my home. Um, and I paid 392000 Irish pounds for it back in 1999, I think it was. And I ended up selling that property like six years later for $1.9 million. And so it like it just grew rapidly. And... Now, when you look at prices, now that was probably a bit inflated because of the boom or whatever, but you go and look at that same road and the house prices are all around 1.5 million or whatever it is. 
um, 1.7 million maybe. And so something I paid 390, I can remember my father-in-law when I bought that property saying that I was nuts. And he said that, you know, he didn't know what the hell I was doing paying that kind of money for this property and that I'd lost my marbles. And here it is, you know, a couple of years later, I sell it for, you know, four times that price. So people always think that price, the prices are mad at the time, but inflation does creep in and you've got general inflation and, you, and then you've obviously got rising property prices and um, they, you know, they can kind of dis decouple slightly and you can have one moves ahead faster than the other. But I do think that there is a chance that property prices will be substantially higher in the future. It doesn't just stop because 2008, we're now at the price that things were back in 2008. Now, one of the things to remember as well, just part before I kind of finish out on this, is the drivers. And this is another talk that I gave in a podcast a couple of weeks back. And I talked about the drivers behind the housing market. And the, the primary drivers that are driving the housing market are supply constraints and just this massive demand, pent up demand. And it's not just here in the Irish market, but it is all over the world. You've got it in the US, you've got it in the UK. And the thing is, is, is that those have not changed. I mean, if there is a massive market crash tomorrow morning, the Irish market is still going to have the same imbalance in its supply and demand. And therefore, that doesn't change. Now, what could change is that it could mean that access to capital and the ability to kind of raise finance quickly or easily could become more difficult. Um, if you've got, at the moment, if the market generally, what everything has been going up, so you have a situation where um, crypto is gone crazy in the last couple of years. You've got stock market has gone crazy in the last couple of years. Property market has gone crazy in the last few years. Borrowing costs have been extremely low for the last couple of years. All of this stuff has just drove this big asset bubble. And it's been going really, really well for everybody. And if you're out there and you've got, you know, lots of different, a lot of people, you know, the good advice is always to diversify. So if you're diversified across crypto, stocks, bonds, and then real estate, and maybe you've got a company as well or whatever. And if everything is doing really well across all or five or six, then you feel wealthy. You feel really like you're doing very well. Um, but, but if there was a sudden crash, and it was a significant crash, like, you know, a, nine, a 2008 style crash, you'd be into a situation where despite the fact that the supply and demand is still there for the real estate prices to sort of be sustained, you will have a lot of investors that are suddenly a little bit nervous that, oh, hold on a second, now I've just, my stock market portfolio has fallen in half. Um, my crypto has fallen by 90%. I'm no longer feeling as wealthy. I've, I don't feel like I have a, enough, a, a lot of money out there. And if people are borrowing on this stuff, which is a lot of the time people, they go and they trade and they use these accounts that are margin trading accounts. And so you basically buy, borrow 10 times what you actually have in cash. So if the property market, or not the property market, if the stock market or the cryptocurrencies, if they collapse or if currencies in general collapse, you can have a situation where investors suddenly are margin called and they have got to get cash in order to kind of repay the bank or whatever. And in that situation, they suddenly feel nervous. They have to actually sell maybe a real estate deal in order to free up cash to shore up the hole that they've created over the other investment. So all of this can have an impact and it can mean that you are in a situation where even though the the fundamentals are strong for real estate, that there could be this just this temporary issue where um, access to capital is constrained. Maybe the banks get a little bit nervous because some of their clients have got into trouble with debt in some of the other stuff like the stock market or whatever it is. And so they start to tighten uh, the reins a little bit and maybe reduce the amount of borrowing that's going out there. All of this can have an impact. And so um, just be careful. Rates can go up, obviously, as I mentioned, but the likelihood is that they won't because the governments can't increase them substantially because they will actually hurt themselves if they do. But I do think there's a strong possibility that there will be a softening of the market. Um, if you do have spare cash lying around, and a lot of people probably don't because if there's a lot of inflation, then you don't want to have a lot of cash. But if you did have cash, it might be a good time to buy. But of course, that's my opinion. And um, you have to kind of make your own decisions on that one. Short term pressure could reduce access to money. Um, making people a little bit nervous. The big question is, 
are we in for a 1929 depression type drop or a 2008 time drop? Um, all very good questions. I, if anyone has a crystal ball, please let me know. Hope you found this one interesting, guys. Catch you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you enjoyed the show or found it in any way useful, please take a moment to leave a review over on iTunes or alternatively share the episode out on social media or with a friend. This really helps the podcast reach more people. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover in future episodes, please connect with me via my Facebook group that's called Behind the Facade Community. And from now on, you're going to see me posting pretty much daily over on my YouTube channel, Gavin J. Gallagher. So do check out that out and become a subscriber over there. But if you're not a fan of YouTube, you can continue to stay up to date with all of the projects and stuff I'm working on by joining my tribe and becoming part of my email list. And you'll find that over at GavinJGallagher.com. All right, guys, that's all for now. See you back here next week. <laughs>